So let's talk about sacred music in the context of church teaching. What does the church have to say about sacred music? It's a foreign term for many people, and it was for me for a majority of my life. So the word sacred, we first got to know, what does that mean? Because sacred can have a lot of different meanings to a lot of different people. Sacred comes from the Hebrew, Kodesh, and the Greek, Agios, both of which means separate, cut off, or set apart. The first meaning of sacred that is absolutely crucial to understanding what sacred music is all about is that separate, set apart, cut off. The Latin root, secare, literally means to cut, to separate, right? So that's the first meaning of sacred is cut off. What that means though, is that it's cut off for a reason. It is cut off for the purpose of worshiping God. That is what sacred means in, in, the, in the general idea of sacred music. Music that is set apart, that is cut off for worshiping God. We have to think about that though, you know, so this isn't just music that's separated for me, the music director, because man, I really like this music, therefore it's sacred music. Nope. It's not music that's set apart for the congregation. This is my jam. This is my favorite music, and it makes me feel a certain way. That's not what the church means by sacred. It means that it is set apart for God. So in prayer, you know, prayer is orientation of the self towards God. And that is what we use. That's what we use sacred music for, is to pray and to pray better by orienting the self towards God. That's what sacred music is all about from the eyes of the church. So you've probably heard of Vatican II, right? We've all heard about the spirit of Vatican II. We're doing this in the spirit of Vatican II. What does Vatican II actually say? Something that's pretty cool is it says a lot about music. So much that the biggest document to come out of Vatican II, Sacrosanctum Concilium, there was a document added to it called Musicum Sacrum that came a little bit further down the line because people really wanted to know, what do you really mean about music? So I want to share with you a couple of the key quotations from Vatican II that are the instructions for all of the music directors uh, around the world in the Catholic Church that they tell us how to approach sacred music. Okay, so the first one is from Sacrosanctum Sanctum Concilium, and I'll read it to you. Sacred music is a necessary and integral part of the solemn liturgy, whose purpose is the glory of God and the sanctification of the faithful. So here the council is painting a more explicit picture of what sacred music is, and in the modern age, that's what Vatican II was all about. So it's telling us that it is about the sanctification of the faithful and the glory of God. And it's telling us that it's not add-on. It's not icing on a cake. It's not decoration. It is actually necessary and integral to the solemn liturgy. That's a big deal and everything else that follows. Keep that in mind. So I've got a second quotation for you. The musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value greater than that of any other art. The main reason for this preeminence is that as sacred song, united to the words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. Therefore, sacred music is to be considered the more holy in proportion as it is more closely connected with the liturgical action, whether it adds delight to prayer, fosters unity of minds, or confers greater solemnity upon the sacred rites. So intuitively, most of us know that music affects us profoundly. That's why we care so much about it. I care deeply about the music at Mass, and I bet you do too. Everybody does. Music is this fundamental human thing. But it's not random, and a, a lot of it is subjective, absolutely. And there are a lot of objective qualities to it as well. And the Church Fathers give us an idea, a mold, of what to do with music when music is present at Mass. So I want to go back to one key part to the quotation here, right? Sacred music is to be considered the more holy in proportion as it is more closely connected with the liturgical action. So 
it's not icing, it's actually, it's part of the cake, right? So during the offertory, right? So, you know, you're bringing the gifts up, right? And, and there's, there's a blessing of the gifts and so on. We're not just singing our favorite Bon Jovi piece, right? You know, as much fun as that might be, right? The music is actually integral to the action that the priest is taking during the offertory. So then there's this unity between every action in the liturgy and the music itself, which is just one more aspect to, to think about that really clarifies thinking. There's one more aspect of this quote that I want to go over that's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. The musical tradition of the Universal Church is a treasure of inestimable value. Okay, great, we care about music a lot. We can't value what it's worth so much. Greater than that of any other art. So the church is teaching us and has actually taught through century after century, that the musical tradition of the church, that sacred music, sekari, that the music set apart exclusively for worship is worth more than Michelangelo, is worth more than all of the architecture, than the marble, than the gold, right? Or any other beautiful thing we do, whether it's painting or sculpture, you know, it is the chief art of the church. It is worth more than all of the other arts. And when we think about how deeply music affects us, I mean, it affects us in our bones. Music changes us. It opens our minds to new things that, that we could never get there, right, if it weren't for music, right? It, it, it affects the heart more deeply than any other art. And don't get me wrong, I love all kinds of art. I'm an absolute omnivore when it comes to art. But music has a special place, right? And the church has always recognized this. And then when it came to Vatican II, it said again, hey, Music, it's, it's not this extra thing. It is actually core to who we are as humans and sacred music is core to who we are as Catholics when we're at Mass. So the Second Vatican Council published Sacrosanctum Concilium in 1963 and then four years later, they published Musicum Sacrum. And they did this because there was so much interest in sacred music and what are we gonna do? And there are all these changes in the Mass and we've, we've, now we're doing it in the vernacular, all this kind of stuff. It's an amazing document. I highly encourage you to read it. Um, if there are any questions you ever have about music and what Vatican II said about music, don't trust what someone else says because people say all sorts of things. Just read the document. It's 10 pages or something like that. So I've got three quotations from Musicum Sacrum that I want to share with you that are just gems. Okay, the first one. Pastors of souls should take care that besides the vernacular, Vernacular meaning whatever your native language is, you know, in, in here in America, it's usually um, Spanish or English. Pastors of souls should take care that besides the vernacular, the faithful may also be able to say or sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the mass which pertain to them. I heard growing up, I mean, the first 20 years of my life was Vatican II said no more Latin in mass. But then you read what Vatican II put out there and it says, oh yeah, pastors of souls have to make, make uh, have to, they should take care that everybody, the faithful, everybody can sing the mass parts in Latin. So it says the ordinary, and that just means your mass parts like your Gloria and your Holy Holy and so on. We're all supposed to know those in Latin. That is not something I grew up with and I bet most of you didn't either, right? So that's, that just, that blew my mind the first time I read it. So here's the next one. Whenever for a liturgical service, which is to be celebrated in some form, one can make a choice between various people, it is desirable that those who are known to be more proficient in singing be given preference. Yikes. I love getting together uh, with friends and family and just jamming out. And sometimes you make beautiful, amazing music and sometimes you make terrible music, but it's fun either way, right? There's just, there's so much joy in music making. So don't get me wrong, I love that. But this is a teaching from the church. Why is that? It's because mass is different. Mass is not a community gathering, right? We're not gathering to say hi, although we do that and that's awesome. I love seeing people at mass, right? But that's not the purpose of why we're there. We're oriented towards God. We turn and we face God in worship, right? And so when we're, when we're taking that on, when we are worshiping Jesus, when we are worshiping the Eucharist, right? And if we really believe in transubstantiation, whoa, that music matters. What we do matters. That's, that's on a whole other level. 
I am always going to get together with friends and jam and make music. That's awesome. But then when it comes to music at mass, the church takes that very seriously. And we should really always try to give our best efforts. And so it's literally telling music directors here, hey, you need to, you need to choose carefully. You really need to have the best output that you possibly can because it matters so much and it affects people so much, right? So that's one other thing. It kind of tells us the mind and the heart of the church that this matters, that it's not just y'all come, which is great. Don't get me wrong. In other contexts, I love it. But then when it comes to mass, we're really supposed to bring our very best, right? So that's one more aspect of Musicum Sacrum that um, often gets lost, right? That we don't always see that. But it's a beautiful thing when it's compassionately uh, brought out in a music program at a church. So I've got one more quotation for you. This one is from the germ, the general instruction of the Roman Missal. Since the faithful from different countries come together ever more frequently, it is desirable that they know how to sing at least some parts of the ordinary of the Mass in Latin, especially the profession of faith and the Lord's Prayer set to simple melodies. So again, we have another instruction. Hey, you should be able to sing in Latin, right? That was absolutely lost for me, you know, growing up. Had zero of that, right? Um, and the reason for that here is beautiful. So here at Christ the King, uh, we have a large Vietnamese population, a large Hispanic population, English speaking, and we have, I think, at least three other languages represented, and it's probably a bunch more that I just don't know, right? So we have all these cultures and traditions, and it is so beautiful to be at Mass, and we're all together, but wow, our unity is taken to another level when we are all singing something together in Latin, right? And um, it's, it's easy to kind of feel the first time you experience that or hear that, you know, kind of go, well, I don't know Latin. The Latin parts that we learn, the ordinary of the Mass are the most repetitive. They're the things that never change, right? The Lord's Prayer doesn't change, right? So once we learn it in Latin, we know that for the rest of our lives, right? So, but there's this, this aspect of singing Latin that's really extraordinary, that it unifies us as Catholics, as worshiping Christians across cultures. The most beautiful thing in the world is in Mass when we have all these different people from different walks of life coming together in unity as we worship Jesus. So there's a beautiful quotation from Musicum Sacrum, which I wanna share with you that's really hard to get into. It takes some, takes some real thinking to, to really get into. The faithful fulfill their liturgical role by making that full conscious and active participation which is demanded by the nature of the liturgy itself and which is by reason of baptism the right and duty of the Christian people. This participation should be above all internal in the sense that by it the faithful join their mind to what they pronounce or hear and cooperate with heavenly grace must be on the other hand external also that is, such as to show the internal participation by gestures and bodily attitudes, by the acclamations, responses, and singing. So, prior to Vatican II, I wasn't alive then, but what the history books tell me is that singing and the Mass was very different. And it kind of, it sounds like, you know, most people uh, believe that it kind of had adopted a bit of a fossilized form where it was um, a lot of professionals who would sing at Mass and, and the faithful would just kind of sit there, right? And so after Vatican II, right, we, uh, there was this big movement within the church that we wanted to increase participation for those who were attending Mass. Sounds like a great idea. And that's exactly what Vatican II promoted. This is telling us exactly what that means. What does this participation mean, right? Participation could mean a lot of things, and it lays it out for us here. The faithful shall ful uh, fill, fulfill their liturgical role, and so on. The participation, and then this sentence right here. This participation should be, above all, internal. So everything else we do that's external, right? Our, our gestures, our kneeling, and our standing, and then we sing a response, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, and we sing the psalm, and we sing a hymn, and whatever. All those other things are super important. They are part of participation, but they're secondary. The first time I read that, I mean, that, that really surprised me, right? Again, because of all the things I've been told about what Vatican II said and so on. But then what Vatican II says in the document 
is this participation should be above all internal. I will tell you, I am, I'll be the first person to admit, I'm not very good at internal participation, at being able to sit quietly and pray, to join my mind to the liturgy, to join my mind in worship. It takes work. It really does. As I've learned to go down that path, just speaking for myself personally, I can say that there are these rich fruits that come from being able to join your mind and your will and your spirit with what's going on, to be totally present, to not be thinking about, boy, I hope I get out in time because the Titans kickoff is at 1 p.m. or something, right? We all know that once our mind goes there, we're just, we're lost, right? But to be totally present, it is not easy. But that is where the deepest fruits and the deepest riches of participation come from. It's hard to teach, it's hard to talk about, it's hard to do, but it has the biggest payoff. So that's the kind of participation uh, that Vatican II is asking the church to do. And yes, external as well. I mean, we gotta sing as Catholics, it's great to sing, right? But that's secondary to the more important internal participation. You might hear that and then think, does that mean I shouldn't participate? I mean, and that's a fair question. But there's, there's a unity here that happens when we put the internal participation first, but don't throw away the external. We wanna do them both, right? There's so much beauty and joy when we all join our voices in song. Even if only half the people join their voices in song, it's still beautiful, right? So we still want to have all of these wonderful and meaningful, uh, beautiful ways to participate externally with our bodies, with our voices and so on. But you know, it's, it's one of those things, it's like if you get the first thing right, it just creates all of these, these spiritual fruits. And uh, for most people, myself included, if you get that internal participation going, it actually gives fuel to that external participation. It makes it more meaningful. Uh, how many of us have ever gone to Mass and just kind of gone through the motions and it feels monotonous and all this kind of stuff? The internal participation is what cures that. And then it makes all of the actions more beautiful uh, and just gives them a new life. I've got one final quotation from Musicum Sacrum I want to share with you. Gregorian chant, as proper to the Roman liturgy, should be given pride of place. This is a big sentence, and you'll see music directors all around the country, you know, talk about this sentence from Musicum Sacrum. Pride of place. So in the original Latin in Musicum Sacrum, it's principum locum, which you might also translate as principal place or the first place. And the idea here is that Gregorian chant is, even though it's foreign to many of us at this point because of you know, just the way things have gone in the last few decades with music and so on in the church, even though it's foreign to so many of us, it is actually the musical language of the Catholic Church. And so we are told by the church that it should be given pride of place, the principal place, the first place. It is the first choice for music at Mass is Gregorian chant. That's another big one that, um, that is surprising to many. One more line. I mean, the first time I read Musicum Sacrum, I was just eyes wide open the whole way I went through it. Just incredible because I had been told all these other things that the church said, and then I thought, well, I'm just going to read the thing itself. Mind-blowing. Highly encourage you to do it.